This is Rick Jones of Fishbait Marketing, and I'd like to welcome our listeners back to From the Bridge. Our show today centers around presentations, which are so critical to making connections with customers and closing a sale. Speaking of of making a connection with fans, my guest angler today is Sam Dunn of the Wrangler Network, a unique digital network and business model to reach rodeo fans. And we'll have another Tuesday tip and another On the Road with Rick segment. So saddle up and let's get started. In event marketing and corporate sponsorships, we ultimately sell magic to both fans and to the corporate sponsors. So we need to make sure our presentations are truly magical. So let's start with when to pitch. Now, I've told you before that all God's children hate Mondays. So never, ever, never do you make a presentation on a Monday. I like to use Mondays as my research or planning days. In fact, we record the podcast on Monday mornings because uh, no one wants to hear from me on Mondays. Uh, Then I look at Tuesdays, and those are great days to schedule calls or follow up with people. And again, I don't bother anybody on a Monday to follow up because they're caught up in the week and all the things that need to happen. But then for me, Wednesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays are sales days. And in my opinion, Friday mornings are the very best times to make presentations. Not early Friday mornings, but late mornings that you hope will lead into, hey, can we go to lunch afterwards? Now, what do we do before the presentation? Well, as I mentioned before, I'm not opposed to actually sending the presentation deck or the concept in advance, because in some ways, it changes the dynamic from a presentation, a one-way street, a one-dimensional, one-directional presentation to an actual working session. And in order to close deals, you got to quickly get into working sessions. By sending the presentation or the concept in advance, it also speeds up the Q&A. And it also shows that you trust the person's intelligence, that you believe they can make a great decision on their own before you get there. Now, I want to know a lot of things about where we're going to make the presentation. I want to know about the size and the configuration of the room. Is there an access to a kitchen where I might can prepare food that I'd like to serve? What are the seating configurations? What types of AV are in the room and other things like that? Next, I want you to remember that we are pitching to human beings and senses play a huge role in presentations. Next week, we're going to discuss this in great detail. So how many of you out there actually rehearse and practice your presentations? People think practice makes perfect, but that's not correct. Perfect practice makes perfect. And the way to do that is to rehearse. It's kind of like a play. You practice your script. You practice your role, the roles of others. You figure out what roles your teammates are going to play in the presentation. Who's going to do what? but you also practice answers to possible key questions, concerns, or objections the prospect may have. Now, what do you bring to the presentation? Well, we're going to talk about senses next week, but I want to bring something that engages all of the senses. Sight, sound, touch, smell, taste. And again, we're going to have much, much more on this element next week. I also like to bring collaterals to dress the room. Let's face it, you're in a conference room. There's nothing more boring than a conference room. How do you create magic? Well, you can bring point-of-sale materials, or you can bring posters, or you can bring a variety of things that make the room look differently when they walk into the room. I like to have those collaterals already have their logo on them so they can already see how they're participating uh, with the event or activity or organization. We usually like to kick off every presentation with some sort of video of the event or a video of the theme. Again, we're selling connectivity to human beings, and we want to show human beings interacting with the particular activity. I uh, 
like to also put testimonials on the videotape. Maybe it's the fans talking about how much they like it or consumers that are shopping in stores talking about why they bought that product because they supported a particular activity. Clearly, other corporate sponsors can lead testimonials on the videotape. Again, we bring props to deliver the magic because this is about theater. And we have only one chance to make a great first impression. Now, I don't trust other people's AV equipment. What happens if it breaks? Then you're screwed. So I always bring my own as a backup. And so if something happens in that room, I've got something that we can utilize to do that. I also always like to bring food. Everybody likes food. Um, And we're going to talk a little bit more about that next week, too. I also bring a thanks for meeting me gift. And for me, I bring a copy of my book to everybody that I give to them at the end of the meeting, thanking them. That kind of changes sometimes their outlook on me. They go, God, this guy's guy's published a book. Uh, And so it kind of changes the fact that you are an authority on the subject because you actually have a book. Now, in the presentation, let me say this to all of you out there. You got to be yourself. You know, you got to be your personality. You can't take stripes off a zebra. But at the same time, I try to balance my personality. Here's what I do know about me after years and years. You either really like me a lot or you don't like me a lot. You're rarely indifferent about Rick Jones. And so I try to balance my personality. You know, if you're a male, do you bring a female? Uh, If you're old, do you bring somebody young? I think you want to make sure that they understand that uh, this is a team of people making this presentation and not just one person. Uh, And I think you've got to use your people resources appropriately. If you're talking about how millennials are going to interact with your brand at an event, you might want to have a millennial actually make that part of the presentation. A big key to success in presentations is your likability. Do they feel comfortable doing business with you? Do you express common interest? Do you show empathy for their challenges? Do you show a positive attitude? Can we bring something of value here? Do you come off as authentic? Do you link your shared common interest? Are you credible? Are you knowledgeable? Are you insightful? How is your storytelling? Because people respond better to stories and they interpret your stories and make your stories their stories. Do you make an emotional connection? And do you articulate the next step? In every presentation, I don't do any what I call negative recruiting. I don't do any put downs of the things that they are currently involved with as sponsors. Nobody wants to hear any negatives. I also try to make an ally of their agencies because agencies may not make you, but they can break you. And so I like to show the agency how they might make money from the activity that we're being uh, asking their client to uh, sponsor. Um, I always like to answer all but one of their questions, even if I know the answer. I'll tell them that I will get back to them with the answer to that, and then I'll do that very, very quickly that shows responsiveness. And so they know that we are going to work with them and be responsive to their needs going forward. Now, we're going to talk about pricing in another session, but I want you to understand this. The dollar value of the deal is non-negotiable. We're not selling cars here, but the terms are negotiable. Okay. And so I may give you a discount if you can pay in two weeks, or I may give you a discount if you can do a multi-year agreement, but I'm not discounting the package that I've shown them. If they've got less money, that means I'm going to give them less assets and benefits. Doesn't mean I'm not going to do a deal. It's just going to be, I'm not going to do that deal. I've seen this happen too many times where somebody will come in and say, well, this is a $100,000 package. Well, will you take $50,000? Oh, yes. Well, then it was a $50,000 package. And you come off looking like a phony and a hypocrite. And we don't want to do that. Now, we're going to talk more about pricing. And we're going to talk more about overcoming their objectives on another show very soon when we talk about dating.
Now, here's your Tuesday tip. We've been talking today a lot about presentations. And I think one of the mistakes we make in giving presentations is we give the prospect our picture. We give them the program that we believe they want and not the program that they might want. I'm not real big on prefix dinners. You know, occasionally they're kind of neat, but most of the time I like looking at a menu and kind of beginning to make choices of what I want to eat at that meal. And so here's what you do in presentations to deliver that. I call it the paint by numbers story. Remember when you were a kid and you got a a book and it was, uh, the picture was there, but the colors weren't there. But on each part of the picture was a number. And over to the side of the picture was a corresponding color matching that number. And so number two was orange. And so you colored in orange. And number four was green. And you colored in green. Well, that's what you kind of need to do in your presentations. You want to give them room and a vision to paint their own picture. And here's one of the reasons that I like to present, as I've told you before, on Fridays. Because when you give them a paint-by-numbers shell of a picture of what their sponsorship program could look like on a Friday, they're going to go home on Saturday and Sunday, and they're going to noodle that idea, and they're going to begin to fill in the picture the way they want to fill it in. And that's your Tuesday tip. My guest angler today is my good friend Sam Dunn of the Wrangler Network. Sam and I met in the late 1990s when he was working at Host Communications, and we've been great friends and business colleagues ever since. Sam left Host to create Bluegrass Management with business partner Malcolm Jennings, and he'll talk a little bit about Bluegrass Management, but they're one of the top hospitality companies in the country. And then later he went to work with Gordon Whitener, our good friend on the U.S. Cowboys tour, and then help form the Wrangler Network. So let's cowboy up and welcome Sam Dunn to the bridge. Sam, welcome and thanks for being with us from the bridge. Hey, uh, Captain, I wish I was down there on the bridge with you, man. Well, we've got uh, a nice day today. There's a little hint of fall here, um, which is kind of rare for this time of year, and uh, we're kind of seeing it. You know, we've started college football season, and uh, that's when you like that good brisk fall weather. So I'm uh, I'm looking forward to uh, a great uh, football season. Um, so how are things in the Commonwealth? I, I think you and Virginia, I think Kentucky and Virginia are the only two states that refer to themselves as the commonwealths and not as states. Uh, so, oh, I, I, yeah, Lindsay just reminded me that Massachusetts is one. So I guess there are three, there are three commonwealths out there in uh, 47 states. So uh, tell, tell me, let's tell the listeners a little bit about your background. I know you were born and raised in Kentucky. Uh, you, you, you bleed blue. Uh, you're a big uh, Cats fan. Went to the University of Kentucky. When you got out of Kentucky, what what came first? What what started your journey in this business? Well, I, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna correct you a little bit because I have two degrees. My first degree was from Moorhead State University, and uh, I had a classmate up there by na- by the name of Phil Sims. And uh, Phil kind of put Moorhead on the map after uh, he got into the NFL, and then from there I went to University of Kentucky and had a degree from there. So you know I've got I've got more degrees than than liver pills, <laughs> but, uh, they've all been great experiences. And, uh, you know, Rick, your, your first venture was into college basketball or into basketball coaching. And my first venture, uh, was in parks and recreation. I was a parks and rec guy. And in the early eighties, I had, uh, my first job was a uh, coordinator of special events, uh, for the parks department in Lexington, Kentucky. And it was a real unique period for our town during the eighties, because we had a mayor that was very much interested in putting Lexington on the map for economic development. And also he kind of got sports tourism and this was the early days of sports tourism. So in 83, 
Uh, we were one of 16 towns to have a senior PGA tour event, which had just started in 78. In 85, you'll recall, uh, Lexington and Rupp Arena hosted uh, the NCAA Final Four. Probably one of the most memorable games ever when uh, I think Villanova didn't miss but two shots the entire game or something ridiculous, and they upset uh, Georgetown. Uh, and there was some kind of special. I think that was the next to the last. It was the last. In in the small arenas, yeah. It was yeah. a small arena, yeah. you know, 23,000. Yeah. And from that point forward, they went into the – larger arenas and the domes, but that was in 85. Uh, we did a women's final four, uh, a year after that. And then, um, we also did something in our town. We were always looking for various activities, but we did, a another, um, statewide activity called the bluegrass state games. And it was an amateur athletic competition, a festival in the summer for anybody, any skill level, any age. And we were the second largest, uh, we had the second largest state games behind the Empire State Games in New York. So that was a very, very exciting period uh, in time. And, and I got a lot of great experience and had the opportunity to be tied in with a lot of unique, unique events. And, um, you know, in some cases helped create some some unique events. Well, it sounds like, you know, at a very young age, you got to do a lot of different things. And, I, you know, I'm often asked by young people, uh, how do I get in this business? And, you know, I say get a, 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 a broad breadth of experience. Don't be pigeonholed into one thing. Uh, go someplace where you're going to get to do multiple things instead of one place you're going to get to do one thing. Repeat it all the time. You know, I, I got a resume from a kid the other day, and he said, hey, I got five years of experience. And I said, well, not, you know, not exactly you got one year of experience repeated five times. <laughs> yeah. And that's not such a good thing. And so, and so, you know, between running state games and, 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 and sports tourism and golf tournaments, you, you got to learn a whole lot of stuff. And then did that lead you to Jim host? Yeah. You know, in the, um, I rose kind of rose through the ranks of the, of the city. And then I ended up, uh, the last four years, uh, was in a unique position. I was a commissioner for, and reported to the mayor, but also I was the tournament director of the uh, Bank One Classic, the senior tour. And then I was executive director of the state games. And I, I, you, could, you can't write a resume, uh, or, you know, a job description that talks about how, that, how interesting that was. But, uh, and along the way, I ran into Jim, and we had a lot of common interest. And... Um, one day he said, you need to come by and see me. And so I did. And he said, uh, I'm looking at expanding the business and I think you'd be a good fit. And I said, well, I think I'm interested. I've, I've, you know, paid, uh, had a great run in, in government service, but I'm ready to move on. And so in the October of, uh, 97, I went to work for Jim. And, uh, what's interesting about it is two weeks before I got there, um, guy named Dave K. Wood joined Jim's team, and uh, that uh, Dave and I were we, we were we were the newbies. Of course, Dave came over from the NCAA and returned to his roots in Kentucky, and uh, we became fast friends and uh, kind of wingmen uh, during our our run at host. But uh, Jim wanted me to focus on uh, the association management side and uh, also hospitality and events. So. Once again, kind of like when I was with the city, I got kind of a blank piece of paper, and uh, that's what Jim gave me. And uh, the first thing I did was I went on, I went, I tried to learn the breadth and the scope of host communication. So I went and met with anybody and everybody. And uh, I think other than Jim and a few others, may, maybe the CFO, I had a, after the first six months, I had a better understanding of the company than most people that were just focused in their one area. And that gave me, kind of a unique uh, opportunity to to try to do things with host. That was a very special time, Rick, uh, at host uh, because of the college basketball and then the new technology that was emerging and what we were doing with hospitality and all. And, um, you know, the team, the, the people that we hired and the team of people that are host alumni 
you shake your head sometimes when you, you know, when you go through and you look at, at some of the wonderful folks we had the opportunity to work with. Well, I've said that there are really only three great family trees in, in, in the sports marketing business. There's the, the Mark McCormick IMG tree that so many great people came out of, including Sean McManus, who's at uh, CBS Sports now. And, and then there was the ProServe Advantage tree with Donald Dell and Frank Craig Hill and Lee Fentress and, uh, and uh, others <clears throat> that were part of that. David Falk, who was Michael Jordan's agent. And I came out of that, that tree. And then there's the Jim Host, Host Communications tree that I was also privileged to be part of that tree, also in 97. That's when you and I met. I went to work uh, with Jim uh, at the strategic group that became the Jim group. And uh, uh, that was, I came to work for him in July of 97. And you talked about hospitality. Uh, Host did, in my opinion, the finest hospitality program I ever had a chance to be a part of. And that was the annual uh, trip to the Derby. Uh, talk about that uh, trip and why that was so ex- so special for for host customers. Well, it was unique because the Derby is unique. It it uh, I like to say that it has three great components. It has a sports the sports component. It has the social component, and it has the gaming component. And you put all three of those together, and it makes for um, uh, a very unique hospitality event that that uh, husbands and wives can attend. I mean, you know, when we were in golf tournaments, a lot of times the guys come out and, and the girls and the ladies, you know, they don't show up. But when it came to the Derby, uh, trust me, the ladies were running, were running the lead on that deal. Uh, but uh, Jim felt like it was something unique to Kentucky. Kentucky. We were very proud of the fact that it was Kentucky based business and, uh, it just, uh, it was the pageantry. It, it was just something that, that was very unusual. And you would get people that would, um, let their guard down and, and, you know, just be really comfortable. And it was like a family reunion. I'll never forget that, um, you know, Roy Kramer and his wife would come every year and I'm sitting here going, these are the nicest people in the world. You know, they reminded me of, you know, just absolutely the humblest people I'd ever met. And they would have the biggest time. They couldn't wait to get there. And, you know. Uh, well, people forget Roy Kramer, before he was the commissioner of the Southeastern Conference, was a was an outstanding football coach. And I, I, I've always said coaches are the best people I know. Uh, and, but he, he and his bride were, they would come every year and have such a great time. And time and again, we'd have people that would come and really relax. It gave them a chance to relax and let somebody else take the lead and and whatever. But, uh, the Derby is, you know, um, a lot of the travel companies will say that the, the Derby is number one on the bucket list for sports, for sports activity. Well, talk a little bit about your hat program. You, you and Malcolm had done a that, – that, that's one of my favorite stories. Tell everybody this story. Well, we knew the Derby was all about the ladies. And we, uh, we found uh, a lady that was a fairly renowned hat maker, and we were looking for something fun to do the night before the Derby. So we started engaging with the customers like three months out. And we said, you know, we're going to just custom design a hat for you. So we asked them to send a picture to us, send a picture of their dress that they were going to wear or dresses they were going to wear. And then also, uh, you know, if, if, if the picture doesn't have the color right, go to the paint store and get paint chips that match your, your dress colors, which sounds bizarre, but it works. And uh, so anyway, we had, we had ladies – we had a custom hat made for each lady. And then the night before the Derby after dinner, we'd bring them back to the hotel and we'd open up the hat store and they'd walk in and they were trying to find, you know, the hat that they thought was theirs that would match the colors and all. And it was, it was over the top. It was over the top and such. And just uh, once again, just, just people having fun. I mean, these, these people, you know, they they want for nothing, but 
the fact that somebody could surprise them with with a special hat uh, meant something to them. And well, I like the fact that the the, the 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 woman knew that there was no hat like that anywhere else in the world. It was made just for her, and that was a very special uh, keepsake and a and a and a great thing to do. You know, host is renowned for the sports marketing side, but I think a lot of people f- forgot that they were heavily involved in the association management business and that, you know, Jim, oh, you know, led the National Tour Association, the NTA. And, um, but talk a little bit about what Host did there because that was a lot of association management, was a lot of convention um, management, but also a lot of hospitality management. It was, and and once again, the NTA um, was very important uh, because it, um, you know, it, it it brought those people together and uh, the, the the operators together, and they could, and and they were in that in that particular environment, they weren't competing; they were cooperating with each other and trying to help them. But you know, the tourism side is so so incredible um and in particular the sports tourism has become so big uh that we sometimes we under underestimate what's going on in that side of the business and i was with my neighbor and we drove an hour this weekend to go to watch his grandson um play baseball 12 year old and we went to a sports par- facility that was incredible and i mean there were teams there from five or six different states and I'm going, these people get it because everybody that's coming to town is eating, putting fuel in their car and staying in the hotel and they're creating revenue. And, uh, that, that was, that, that was just, it's just amazing where that whole business has gone over the years. Well, my, you know, my, one of my partners, Mike Malay of engagement partners also owns a company called Clancy sports. And what Mike does, he's probably the leading, worldwide consultant in sports tourism because of what he did down at Disney at Wild World of Sports for all those years after running the New Orleans Sports Commission. And it, it is a big business. Sports tourism is a big business. Uh, and, and the hospitality business has become a big business. So so you come to a fork in the road and you leave host. And, uh, let, me, and, let me back up for yeah, one minute, Rick, sure. because yeah. there's, there's something I want to mention that I think is relevant. Um, first of all, uh, during, during my time at host, we were um, we were running Hoop It Up, and uh, of course that was a multi-city tour. And what's what's intriguing about Hoop, Hoop It Up is the people that were involved in those years. You know, we were working with the NBA, and we worked daily with Adam Silver, and we worked with Heidi Ubroth and Mark Tatum had just come on as a as a brand new guy there. And on our side, you know, we had. People, people like Tim Klein and Tad Brown, who have gone on to much bigger and better things. But we, you know, Terry Murphy created that concept. The D magazine around, in Dallas, yeah. And it went around the went around the country. But what's unique about it is next year at the 2020 Olympics in Tokyo, three on three basketball is going to be a sport. And it you 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 go, dang. That thing started back in the 90s, and, you know, people were exposed and all. And you turn around, in 2020, it becomes a sport. And FIBA got behind it. And um, that was that was a significant uh, program that Host and, and the Hoop It Up team was running. The other one, we did a three-on-three soccer, which was ahead of its time as well. Same concept, uh, but it was in the soccer side. And I think we were we really helped – uh, bring soccer to the forefront, and uh, of course, we would have our national tournament at the Disney Wild World Sports. So, uh, those were those were some significant opportunities. So, um, you know, we we had great experiences at Host. Uh, you know, Jim sold the business. Things went kind of different ways, and uh, I was faced with a decision in early '04 about whether to, you know. To, to try to join somebody else or go my own and and circumstances uh, led me to do my own thing and and so I uh, formed a company called Bluegrass Management Group and brought aboard a longtime partner Malcolm Jennings and uh, we had done a lot of things together and we we focused 
um, really focused on hospitality, event management, and uh, we do run conventions for some, you know, smaller associations. Well, that then led you, at host, you you had a chance to work with Gordon Whitener when he was there for a little while, and then Gordon, you know, is such a great serial entrepreneur, great guy, uh, but is a guy that had been involved in, in, in rodeo for a long time. You know, I like to tell people, you know, for years, NASCAR made a living by telling the marketing communications industry and sponsors that they had the most loyal audience of anybody out there. Uh, well, the truth is, statistically, it wasn't true. But if you tell somebody the same thing long enough and consistently enough, it becomes kind of folklore. And I would go in to talk to people about NASCAR, and somebody would say, yeah, it's the most brand-loyal audience in America. The truth is, statistically, the most brand-loyal audience in America is the rodeo audience. Um, you know, you think about Coors Banquet Beer that's probably got a 0.5 share it's got about a 30 share of the rodeo audience or Ram truck that's got a, a share. But the one that um, astounds me is Wrangler that I think has got about a 95 share of, uh, of all rodeo. So you got in the rodeo business with both the U.S. Cowboy Tour and then the Wrangler Network. T- talk a little bit about rodeo and what you've done in it and what you're doing in it and where that business is going. Well, I got to start by saying I got a weird closet because I got – loafers on one side and cowboy boots on the other so <laughs> and when i go to the airport people people don't really know who who i am but they, they, they know where i'm going um you know actually gordon and i uh uh we, our our rodeo business really uh, got started with jim wilburn and wintercom out in tulsa and mark kidd had migrated over there and they were doing all the outdoor programming for ESPN. And uh, we had an opportunity to produce some events for them. Uh, and then they were going, they t- were televising them. Jim said, Jim Wilburn said, we don't want to run the events. We just want to televise them. So we started producing bull riding on ESPN. And uh, then that gradually migrated to the national finals rodeo where we had a chance to be involved there and, um, you know, uh, rodeo is an interesting event. Um, uh, you know, uh, there's some of the oldest rodeos in the country have been around for 120 years. This is not something that sprang up in the fifties and they're, they're, they're a lot like, they're, they're a lot like festivals. I mean, when I look at the audience these days, uh, of people that are going to rodeos, it's families that want to, uh, it's family entertainment. It's people that want to, you know, they're looking to embrace the tradition, but also have fun. And, uh, that's what makes it work at, at the, at the community level because, um, they, um, you know, they've embraced, they, they've, they've embraced it. They're, they, they may not follow the sport year round, a little different from NASCAR, but they block that weekend out on their calendar every year because they know they're going to be going to the festival. And uh, so we were we were working in that arena for about nine years, and then you know what they say: what goes around comes around. So we, um, you know, we were watch we were going through a period of time in, in 2010, 2011 where the iPhone was making significant inroads on how people were consuming content and our ESPN programming that was not live, those numbers were decreasing. And yet we said, you know, we're seeing it. We, there's, it's not a loss of interest in the, in the activity. It's just things are changing and we're not adapting. So we saw an opportunity there and we got the band back together. I called up Tim Campbell who had, Worked at host and worked at I high. Yep. Yep. He actually with broadcast.com streamed the first, the first content out of, out of, uh, out of March madness with a guy named Mark Cuban. And I mean, he, he, he was there from the start. And so we brought him in. I said, Tim, I've got arenas with video and audio. Is there any way I can, you know, we can, we can put all this together and for a fraction of the cost, put it up. And he said, I think we can. So we ran the numbers and then we said, 
we don't want to have to pay for the rights uh, directly. How can we get around that? And we said, well, Wrangler's the 800 pound gorilla. They're involved in all aspects. Let's see if they want to partner. So we went to Wrangler VF Corporation, uh, made a presentation. And a week later, a week later, they said, we're in, let's go. And so in 2014, uh, we started our journey. And uh, after five years, last year, we had 48 million views and we're, you know, we have a worldwide audience and uh, it's just been an incredible ride. And uh, we, we led the charge on it. Nobody else saw it. Nobody else wanted to see it. Everybody wanted to, you know, change is hard, but we facilitated change and got out there in front of it. And, and so uh, it's been it's been really an interesting experience. Uh, I know all of our friends who are in streaming and working in those environments know that, you know, your resources are razor thin because the whole goal is to minimize the cost and maximize content. So we work hard. We work very hard. Uh, but uh, it's satisfying to see that people are responding to it. Well, it's interesting. You know, we today's show was about presentations, and obviously y'all had that first presentation with your concept to Wrangler, and, and it was really getting them to have a leap of faith that, that you know, collectively y'all could bring something of value to the audience. You, you knew there was an audience that wanted to watch more content in the rodeo business, um, and, and, and equally important, you know, I, I tell people, you know, we talk a lot about college football being a lifestyle, you know, the, the, the Western lifestyle is unique and the rodeo audience lives that Western lifestyle and in terms of food and fashion and equipment and, and, uh, you know, equine treatment and all that. And so in many ways, you know, your, 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 your numbers may not be enormous in terms of your cumulative numbers, but you're talking to, you know, preaching to the choir. You're talking to the right audience uh, in a unique way. And I'm a little surprised, Sam, that that there haven't been other l- similar networks in what I call niches and niche audiences and niche sports. Uh, and I wonder what's your thoughts on why, th- why that hadn't grown as much? Well, uh, there's a couple of things. And, and there was, I, you know, I've, I, I, I read a book um, um, earlier this year with, by Jeff Bezos, and he was talking about he was talking about what, how he talks to his senior team, and he he had a great quote in there. He says, "Is uh, your job is not to think about the small stuff, but to think about how to set the trends and have others follow you. If no one is copying you, then you're not doing the right thing." So. I say that only because in the rodeo side, we had some competitors that have come on, but they but we're adverti- our, our platform is advertising advertiser supported. It's free stream. And everybody that's, that's tried to compete in that particular space has, um, has been in a situation where they, they've tried to you know do pay-per-view, and it just hasn't worked for them. Rick, the, the unique thing about what we were doing on the rodeo side, was that um, there were events, and they were big events, and they were, um, and we had the resources to make it work. But it's there's uh, rodeo is is not standardized, and what I mean by that is, I go to Ellensburg, Washington this weekend, and their rodeo is about two hours and fifteen minutes long. I'll be in Pendleton, Washington for their 124th rodeo two weekends after that, and their rodeo is four hours and 15 minutes long. So unlike a basketball game or a baseball game or some something of that nature, each and every one of these is unique. They have the same events, but they have different pageantry around them, and there's no way to capture that on live television. So it really takes, in my opinion— it can be copied, but it, it ha- there have to be certain uh, criteria in order to copy it and make it work. And we could never afford to do the number of streams we're doing if we had to crew 
you know, with cameras and, and announcers, if we had to crew live streams, it, it just would be cost prohibitive. Well, it's interesting. You know, we, we just launched the ACC network and a big part of the ACC network was the fact that they have studios and, and largely streaming capabilities, production capabilities on each of the 15 campuses. Uh, and so you're right. I mean, you got to amortize your cost, your fixed cost, and then produce a record amount of content in order to do that. Well, Sam, this has been great today. We've really enjoyed having you. You've had such a interesting career. I think the best is still yet to come. Tell your bride we said hello. R- R- Ryan's sitting next to me today, and he said, I hadn't seen Sam in forever. I miss him. So he wanted to say hello, and we well, tell really him I said hello, and and uh, you know Rick, uh, just closing thoughts. Uh, we've both been blessed a long way, and and at the same time, um, you you know you can when you when you got friends that work with you and 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 get excited with you about things. That's what makes it all worthwhile, and and you know. Um, where we 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 celebrate everybody's triumphs and we're there to pick them up when they when they take when somebody told me over the weekend said in a game of sports you either win or you learn you don't lose you <laughs> win or you learn and I thought that was pretty good uh, for a twelve year old's daddy I don't think he was practicing what he was preaching but anyway uh, but we win or learn together and uh, uh, love you brother you guys take care and thank you for the chance to visit. All right, appreciate you. Talk soon. Bye-bye.